Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Binge Town TV's coverage of The Wheel of Time. This will be our instant reaction of episode five, Blood Calls Blood. So instant reaction, we're going to try to keep it as instant and reaction-y as possible. So if you listen to all the other episodes, um, we like to break things up into not really timelines, but I guess plot lines. So we'll kind of tackle some general things. Then we'll go into Matt and Rand's kind of plot that starts to weave into Nynaeve's plot. We'll talk about things that happen in the White Tower. And we'll end with Wayne and Perrin. So nice little softball for everybody in the room. Episode title, Blood Calls Blood. What were we thinking when we, when we saw that? And also, what do we think it means compared to actually now watching the episode? I want to fail this class. I wasn't prepared for these questions. <laughs> blood calls blood. Um, I think it's totally related to the Perrin storyline, most likely. I mean, that's that has, what I was. That was the bloodiest. That's all I could think of. But that uh, that term doesn't really mean much to me, even as a book reader. Um, so blood calls blood. So meaning they killed a uh, nice guy. So you know. He, the the murderer deserves to die. I don't, I don't really. I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, we also saw um, Stepan kill himself, so there's some more blood for you. So I really, I don't know what the connection would be there, but definitely bloody episode. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, if I'm honest. Blood. This stumps a lot of book readers as well. I feel like I saw some conversations on Twitter confused about it. It is the the title of a chapter in the Great Hunt. This is the second book. It's one of the early chapters. But I think, yeah, the two camps are kind of – I like the idea that Karene is dead and kind of maybe she's calling Stepan from the other side because they share that tight connection. So blood calls blood. And then Perrin obviously has this connection with the wolves that they kind of come to his aid. So We did get that graveyard scene where they were burying everybody in the beginning. And also, uh, I mean it was you know, burials from both sides. Like we saw them lay like the king down that was following uh, Loghain. So – I don't know, maybe saying like any violence, like the way the leaf, like any violence leads to blood or something like that. Because you, you like the way the leaf, you talk about it a lot. <laughs> I just, it just sounds cool. I love it. Okay. So moving kind of to talk more about the end of episode four, we were kind of curious of where do we go from here? What are the next steps going to be? And I was shocked that we're one month later. I thought that was kind of a drastic time change. It ends up working out, but when it popped up on the screen, I was definitely surprised. No, I actually like that, um, but it does make me tiny bit nervous because they just showed us right there that it takes time to walk across the continent, so they need to make sure that they're not now jetpacking without these kind of time skips if we're going this this amount of distance. But it's it's I think it's correct. I liked it. Um, yeah, like a time a, a month gives you a lot of opportunity to fill in the blank of what happened on the way there like how matt descended a little bit more in this episode because the month passed right and how the tinkerers and parent and they had their whole storyline together and their relationships were getting strong it's just it's definitely that uh you're sorry i was looking at you laughing uh it's definitely necessary because they had to go a far fucking walk I actually, as a non-book reader, I actually really liked the decision here to go with a, a little bit of a time skip. Uh, it wasn't even like a drastic one. Like I think one month is a, a good amount of time for them to allocate for a time skip. Um, it's just like you know we don't really need to get in too much of the in in intricacies of what like happened immediately after the battle with um, Loghain. It's I think I'm more as an audience member. I think I'm more interested in okay, what are the like longer term effects of that not just the immediate okay we lost an Aes Sedai yes we know that but like what does that look like in this month span so I think this was a really nice touch from from their perspective and getting to see the state of Loghain with a month under his belt of right. being gentle yes I was going to say that and to go along with that uh Matt I mean I know that's jumping storylines but you know Matt has been descending for a month so yeah, I mean, that's literally the next topic I was going to bring up was that we see Matt is much worse than when we left him. He was already pretty bad. Obviously, at the, the Grinwell farm, there was a small part of us, at least myself, that thought he killed the family. So now we see him a month later. He's kind of almost barking at shadows. I don't know if that was that boy actually ran into him or not because it kind of flashes to him in front of them. But yeah, I mean, he's just he's getting there. 
I feel like he did hit the kid. They just didn't want to show him hitting a kid on screen. Um, basically showing that, yeah, he snaps. Because I have a question, too, of we see him a little later when they're at the procession of Loghain. And Loghain is kind of doing that crazy wild laugh in the cage. And then we mm-hmm. cut back to Loghain. And he's not – he hasn't really moved from the cage. So I'm thinking that was also – it seemed like something that Matt imagined and hallucinated. This is going to take – this episode is definitely another – like I need another watch. I need these notes because a lot of it's still slightly vague. But yeah, I originally was freaked out by that scene. Didn't know what was going on. But I think you're right. I think it's just showing Matt snapping. And that's the two specific scenes we brought up right there are not real. Without going too deep into it, I thought that was – you know, real recognize real, meaning, <laughs> you know, Loghain, who has already gone through the madness, already sees, knows what it looks like, looked up and saw Matt. I was like, oh, dude, you're fucked. And just started laughing at him. Um, and nice. then because of the darkness connection, for some reason, it just focused in more on Matt, like one slow-mo and shit like that. But I Another loved it. Watch. I thought that was so cool. Another watch will clear that up. Yeah, I think so as well. But um, one thing that I wanted to note um, – Oh, my question was, um, is it supposed to be known whether it's whatever the knife is that he has that's making him mad? Or is it actually supposed to be that he's getting closer to the one power and that he's going mad from that? Okay, I'm so I'm just going to keep with my theory. I think I said on the last episode that I think it's the knife that's causing this and not his ability to use the one power. Okay. And the last little bit of craziness we see is when we meet back up with Nynaeve. And he snaps at Nynaeve, too. Mm-hmm. And she actually kind of handles it well. She has, she doesn't really freak out. She kind of says, you know, you're tired, you need rest. But I guess I'm just a little curious of what you two, specifically Dave, obviously, and Paul, what you thought at Matt kind of barking at her at that point. Uh, I'm definitely on the page that I think he is possessed or cursed because we – in the past couple episodes uh we've seen that darkness around his mouth that kind of creeps back into his mouth and then immediately when Nynaeve is going to his mouth he grabs the hand and is like get it like get away from me and but then kind of relaxes but i really think it has something to do with the mouth and a curse or possession of some sort but that's just my thoughts yeah i mean dave nailed it I mean, when we saw the darkness retract into his mouth before, um, I assume that's where, like, the first signs are of the madness. It's either the madness or just, like, a darkness curse, like Dave was saying. Uh, I'm not really sure yet. Um, But, yeah, he's just doing everything. Like, the virus in him is doing everything he can to not get caught. Exactly. All I'll say about it is that I'm super happy that the show accomplished making me feel something when Nynaeve finally met up with Random Matt again, because it's been since episode one, since they actually saw her. So I'm happy that they accomplished the feeling of there's been a lot of time and a lot of shit has happened to all everyone involved. So it was cool to see like that emotion, especially out of, you know, Rand, because he's kind of normal at this point versus Matt. <laughs> yeah, at this point, everyone else is struggling a little bit and Rand's kind of yeah, somehow staying a little clean. Exactly. But yeah, it it does. It just warms my heart to see those five characters the emmons field five interact so it's just like i can't help but smile when i saw them reunite obviously makes me a little sad when matt's like that but i really enjoyed rand and nynaeve's conversation as well i thought it was just it's just nice to have those intimate character moments to kind of reinforce this bond that the five of them have they're the only people from this village they're all they have in this world basically so yeah can't wait to rewatch that scene and like actually like talk about the dialogue and stuff in it yeah and Moving on to the the linchpin of that scene, the legend himself, we get introduced to a new character who Luke and I have been just chomping at the bit to finally see in the show. So we meet Loyal the Ogier. Mm. So, so cool. Just I just need reactions on what what you guys think he looks like. Like what what do you guys the reaction to his his look and then his whole personality and, and speech and everything. Well, at first, I did not think Ogre. It took a while. It took until Rand said Ogre. For me, I was like, all right, this science experiment that went wrong is somehow still alive and walking through um, because it's insane to think about, you know, Ogres being like wise and studious and, you know, in charge of the library. You gotta watch your I'm not, not Ogres. I'm sorry. O- Ogares. Yes. Ogares? Yeah. Ogears. Ogears. 
like gear, like the Gear Wars. And, oh, and, okay. Yeah. Are you? How familiar are you with the Gear Wars? Oh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> it. I loved it. I mean, I immediately loved them after the first interaction with Rand. Yeah, I just love those wisecracking, uh, just intelligent characters that are just mystical as well. And I thought it was an interesting take because I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing I'm assuming that Ogier's obviously stems from ogres and i just think if that's the case this is just an interesting take on what we've seen ogres be in the past because you know they're usually the villains or just um maybe not so studious so this is just an interesting take and i like how to go with that interesting take on ogres they also changed the name to ogiers but again i'm not sure if that was like on purpose or not but that's just i thought that was a really cool yeah i Definitely been so nervous about how this was going to play off, especially with the general public, because Loyal is just such a beloved character by the fandom and everybody. He's like, he's just the most lovable. He's sort of like Hagrid, but a little bit more unique, I would say. But Much just smarter. How great he is at not knowing human cues, social cues specifically, and him just going and rambling on and not understanding empathy at, at a human level is so far so good i think they delivered so well like when he's when Rand, i think it was Rand walks into the room and he's heated about something and 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 loyal's in the background just still talking and talking he's like oh you know it's so good that is nailing it as for his concept like of how he physically looks i have no problems with it i've seen complaints from diehard book readers online but it doesn't seem like anybody's outraged and i think the the writer i mean the showrunner rafe loves the actor who plays loyal so you know Full send, I think so far so good. We'll see how he follows up. It's so, it's so yeah. cool just to add another, you know, race into it and, and who lives a completely different lifestyle. Like Rand runs off because he's in a hurry and he's like, ah, humans, and always in a rush. Because <laughs> you know that I have so much like less time and he just he's like, Oh, I'll meet you out there. <laughs> this was also the first um quote unquote good um mystical beasts we've seen i think right like all of them the only things we've come across are fades and trollocs so it is cool seeing that there are those you know more animalistic mystical beast creatures and the more intelligent like uh just able to communicate kind of beast as well so that was a cool as well i think tom maryland is a mystical beast could be he could be. We're going to learn a lot more about him and his people. They are just a very interesting culture. Loyal plays such a great part in the story. Um, I will say, though, I was definitely a little not shocked, but just kind of apprehensive when I first saw him, like immediately when I see him. And then he opens his mouth and starts talking, and he's hitting all the loyal lines. Mm -hmm. You know, your name sings in my ears, Randolph Thor. And he's saying, you know, humans are always so hasty and all these things. And that's like, I, I don't give a fuck what he looks like because he sounds is just perfect. He is yep, loyal. His delivery is there. Yeah, I just I love the guy. Love the guy. So moving into the White Tower type of storyline. Um, just curious. We talked a lot about it on episode four deep dive of all of the politics within the camp and then how it hints a lot at politics within the White Tower. So we get Moraine interacting with, again, Leandrin and Alana just in a different setting. And I'm just curious what people thought about. We're kind of digging deeper into Moraine's relationship with a lot of Aes Sedai. I'm just going to be honest here. Like Luke said, the one first watch through is, is, is kind of tough without taking the notes and everything. Um, but from what I remember from that scene, um, just – just really enjoying the the political views of all the different um the colors of ajas um just seeing how that there are differences within this woman's power group is just really cool i feel like usually in these kinds of situations you know they're all on the same page and they're all for the most part fighting for the right cause but here the the separation and division of characters is just so so much stronger than it is in other books that are like this that it definitely catches my eye and it just makes me continue to wonder if there will ever be an actual like internal war between Aes Sedai because of these conflicting views. So just really cool. Um, loved, love Moraine still. She's amazing. And Leandrin is honestly growing on me, even though she's a little bit of a bitch. Like I just <laughs> like her character a little bit. She knows what she wants. Exactly. She's a woman who knows what she wants and that's hot. <laughs> yeah. She's a hardcore recruiter. Uh, it's really interesting to see the relationships, like you guys are saying, between the heads of the different um, heads of the different factions and Ajas, and 
it's so funny because you know they're technically on the same team but they don't all have the same agenda so it's like all right how is this going to work out in the long run um i mean especially the end of times you know you can all have your different agendas and go and kind of like live with each other but until like the end of times that you guys are supposed to prepare for that hits it's like feels like somebody's going to take over Mm -hmm. and i don't know it could it could just be like a civil war or like a little coup or somebody just shuns another section based off what we know so far the green ajas being the battle ones and the red ones kind of being those um hunter of men almost i would like to see a little battle between the red and the greens i feel like a little christmas day battle how about that just because i feel like they're probably going to be the most strong um in terms of battle magic if you want to call it from the magicians so i I feel like a battle between those two would be really cool someday do you see moraine man that is also very true but moraine i'm getting is like very unique vibes like she is it feels like above the rest we do get a a nice little drop from alana saying that moraine is one of the only women in the tower that would be strong enough to Mm -hmm. kind of fight against who is the Amerlin seat, which is kind of the head of all the Aes Sedai. So I just like that does, little line as well. Does the Amerlin seat also have a color, Aja? She like, came they have, from a color. She like, came from a color, but then once you get to that power, you're not identified with you, the color. You're pretty much the leader of everybody, right? Is yeah. that how it works, Kyle? Yeah, you're really not supposed to kind of give any towards a, any type of favoritism. Oh, what's up, Peach? Any type of favoritism towards the Aja that you came from. Obviously, they're all human, so throughout history... You know, some are better than that than others. Yeah. And you know, I get off to this kind of political talk, especially when it comes to the mages. <laughs> Paul knows. Paul knows. I always bring this oh, up yeah. with the witcher. <laughs> no, I think it's so, I think it's awesome. It's going to be so fun to keep diving deeper. And as you guys start learning about uh, the Aes Sedai in general, and then you start learning about the, you know, you get more representation from each of the different colors, the different Ajas, it's going to be fun to see like we're going to have fun conversations about, Oh my God, dude, you're such a yellow or no bro. Like Brown, you know, like stuff like that. Like it's going to be really cool when you start seeing more attributes because I hate holding my tongue about some of the other ones. But I think if you were paying attention, they do tell you what the yellow was here. If you're, if you're, you know, Mm -hmm. it said they were the healers. Okay, cool. Now we keep that one in the vernacular. (laughs) Yeah. So that one's confirmed. Yeah. Yeah, They said, Oh, I I thought the, the word confirmed, which, you pointed it out and you, you called me after saying confirmed and it came back and you ended up being right. They don't need their hands, yes. but the hands help. And I, one more thing I'll say about this whole storyline is that I am definitely both anxious and like I said, for loyal nervous about what they're going to do with the Amarland seat, not just like her character, but the intentions that are implied from this episode. I'm a little skeptical about where it's going but i'm sure it's not going to let me down these next couple episodes she's got to make an appearance so i'm just hoping that it's powerful and makes sense and it's all rational and then we're good i think we're in good hands yeah so i just really like this part of the episode um everything that happens in the white tower because the complaint a lot of people had about the first three episodes is that it's a breakneck pace almost, especially episode one. I think this is just a great episode to kind of ground us a little bit. We get a lot more world building. We learn a lot more about our characters. We learn more about the relationships with each other. So that was honestly one of my favorite parts of the episode. Mm-hmm. So moving on to a not so favorite part of the episode, <laughs> just in general, Steppen's kind of story arc throughout this episode was, was very sad to watch. We talked about it in the episode four deep dive of how Warders, when they lose their eyes to die, something inside of them breaks. It's a huge, immense, I mean, I'm sorry, huge emotional damage to them. And I just, I just need a, a reaction, a thought about what Steppen ends up doing this episode. I loved every part of this. I, anything to do with the warder and the eyes to die's relationship, um, I just give it all to me. It, it makes me so happy. It's such a cool relationship. And to, we were talking about the time skip. Steppen's been living like this for a month now. Great so it's point. not yeah, it's it's not like, you know, this is the next day and, and he kills himself. Like he's been living with this grief. He had like a few duties to do and he did it. And, you know, if getting gen gentled and being cut off from the one power makes you want to kill yourself, then I can't imagine what a warder is. I mean, they said it's more of a relationship than a husband and a wife or like a mother and daughter. It's like Jesus Christ, like, what's that losing? Like a, like a twin? Like, the second other half of you? 
what is with you in wanting to say Gentile? I want to say I, it. I, I it just sounds more fancy. It. Yeah, it sounds more fancy. Um, but yeah, oh, maybe it was Gentile. A, <laughs> it was a really uh, emotional scene, of course. Um, I'm honestly surprised he didn't like this is really dark, but I'm surprised he didn't off himself a little earlier, if I'm going to be honest. Like the way you see him when he finds out the moment that Karene died and even like still, I just feel like he would have definitely done this a little bit sooner. I don't have a complaint that it, you know, happened a month later. I just <laughs> imagine it happening. Sooner. I would but, hope not. Yeah. But it, it also just very much brought me to thinking about how, what the one power is for guys. Like once, you know, they get a hold of this power and it's lost for them whenever they get gentled, you know, they kill themselves. And that connection to the one power is, very similar to a warrior's connection to the Aes Sedai. And again, just theorizing, I just wonder if that is, if there's a reason that, you know, the closer you get to power, the more you just, I guess, want to be around it in a sense kind of thing. But um, yeah, very emotional. And of course, uh, the actual funeral when land, like they're all just beating their hearts and everything. Like it's just powerful. So powerful. Yeah. I hope to go more into that in a deep dive because mm -hmm. I want to get more. I have some questions behind that last scene. Yeah, this was one of the tr biggest twists as a someone who's read the books I've seen this season so far. I did not expect this out of step in, especially because I haven't met this character yet in the story. And I just thought that he was going to be around. And I was so convinced that he was going to join the three way water squad. Like I was just so all in on that. I was like, that's that's dope. That'll they'll keep the guy around. He's fun. He's cool when he's on screen. And then that twist just came at the end when Land fell, found him. And my God, Lan was just so much emotional acting this episode. It was probably awesome for that actor. Like this was his moment. Like he just showed so he was just so good at just showing this grief that he felt. And then that even further shows the brotherhood of the warder faction or guild, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think that last thing you said nails it. Just that brotherhood, that connection that they they all have. I think that they are doing such a better job of that than it happens in the books. I love all the characterization they've been giving them in these two episodes. Mm -hmm. And I agree. That was one of also one of the highlights of this episode as well. Yeah. And it's just, it's so hard to watch because you're seeing Moraine's crying and then Lan's emotional and you know, they both are feeling what each other's feeling. And it's just kind of, is that emotion reverberating off of each other and making it even more? It's just kind of crazy to think about. I love that Moraine joined in because I really thought she was not going to. And then she like looks in and she starts, then all the other women start doing it too in the room. That was, that was cool. And it's Sorry. I, I, I have to say it real quick. Every, everybody thought of Wolf of Wall Street, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was waiting for them. Uh. <laughs> yeah. That was like one little thing was, that took me out. It of was it. like such a, yeah. It was such a serious moment. And I could think of Matthew and kind of like, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like doing that, like ridiculous shit. <laughs> Dave, it sounded like you had a comment. Yeah, sorry, Dave. That's long gone. I already forget what it was. Uh, right. My bad. No, you're good. So, it wasn't important. So I skipped over this and the general things that I was going to ask, but now that we're on the tail end of the White Tower plotline, what do we think of the view of, of Tar Valon? It's still hard to say it that way. And the White Tower, just the sets inside of it. We get Matt and Rand walking through the town a little bit. Then we get everyone else inside the tower. I'm just curious what you guys thought the sets looked like. Were they um like handmade like the Shadar Logoth like those sets? I would assume they... so. Yeah, um, I would probably because this is probably going to have a lot more scenes even in the future and seasons. Where, and where do we did, did we get confirmation of where it was filmed? Just curiously. So a lot of the a lot of the on site stuff was filmed in I believe the Czech Republic um, and countries in that region. Mm -hmm. This kind of stuff might have been on a set somewhere in some type of Amazon studio, but. Overall, I thought it looked amazing, though. I mean, it's a really beautiful um, world, if you, how I'll call it. Um, just from the intricacies of the insides, like in the funeral, when you can see the walls and all the decor they've got going around in the background, you know, it really shows, I get, to me at least, that they did a lot of research and they know the books really well if the, the, to be able to incorporate all this stuff into these like small rooms and the open world. Um, just absolutely love the sets that they've been presenting to us so far. And that's just the budget of Amazon. Again, they're able to just throw shitloads of money at these kinds of things. It's literally the best money can buy right now. So I just can't complain at all. I think it hits the ceiling of what we're capable of right now in fantasy. And it's amazing. 
Yeah, you love it. You get the sense of the kingdom because, you know, the White Castle is on the top of the hill in the center. So everybody has to look up at it at all times. Um, honestly, it reminded me a lot of Arcane. Um, Dave and Luke, I know you guys watched that. Like that that city. Like you mm-hmm. get on top of the roof and then you can actually see like more than you've ever seen because everything's so crowded down there. And I was getting a Lantris vibes, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, that, that too. <laughs> um, but I honestly, they kept saying like the White Tower, the White Tower. I was expecting just a castle, like like Caramorn. Um, but the fact that there was an entire – what's up, Peach? The fact that there was an entire – city around it too is it's just I, I thought it was really cool twist i wasn't expecting so the white tower is the castle right and then tarval tar valon however the fuck you supposed to say it, is the whole city right yes okay. yeah i think that just the shot of rand and matt on the hill it looks great i mean they got like the shape of the harbor at the i guess that's technically the south end of the island I think the the mountain in the background, it all just uh, it just popped. I thought it looked good. Is the harbor the the taint? I guess technically, <laughs> although it might be more like the butthole. Yeah, I guess. While the the north harbor is more of a clit, I guess we'll talk about that on the deep dive. Okay, that's okay. a little teaser for the deep yeah, yeah, dive. Sorry, that was jumping. We're talking, <laughs> yeah, we're talking about bee holes and uh and clits on the deep dive. <laughs> so tune in. Okay, moving into our final storyline. We got Egwene and Perrin, and I'm just going to say it off the top. We called it, I'm just going to say collectively, we called it in episode four, kind of the boring storyline, but obviously not the case this time. Every kind of scene popped off in this. Um, The first thing I just want to start nice and slow, I guess, is Valda's back. What do we feel about this motherfucker being back? (laughs) Fuck this guy. I was so mad they didn't just destroy his body and put it in the garbage disposal i hated that guy um and i i mean i liked his character before but now i just like every time he's on screen i'm just like i want you to burn so we, badly we knew this was coming this like kind of side of him with if you're gonna burn anybody at the stake like like he did the first eyes to die it's like he's not going to be pl- any better when he's torturing someone for answers and what i hated even most you know is that he was he made that ultimatum where it's like okay like it's either you live or you live and it's not going to be both of you you have to mm-hmm. pick one it's either you lie and tell me she's a an eyes to die so i can just murder her for fun or you're no matter what you're lying to me and i'm going to kill the guy for fun because you guys are just so he was just as a villain i of course i really enjoy his, his character of course, if I were to go into this world of Wheel of Time, I would literally single him out and murder him before anybody else. <laughs> like, he sucks, but yeah. he's a great villain. I'm just waiting for Moraine to, because she said she'll never forget his face. And I'm like, all right, she can't kill him, but like, she can like maim him badly and put him out to basically die, right? Like, there I hope that's what happens. She can just accidentally like, do it. Not, yeah. Like, no, it's just. You know, if you cut somebody's limbs off and leave them in the desert, they might die. Like, yeah, he technically like, didn't kill them. Yeah, it's like the same thing with the old man. It's like, you know, you chose to bleed out in the desert. Like, I just took your leg. Like, I'm not <laughs> actually killing you. It's your decision to just lay there and bleed out. <laughs> yeah, that raft scene was big. Yeah. See, this is just his, like, Joffrey season one equivalent of becoming a true villain moment because yeah. he's got so much more left to offer, I, I, I think. But... Because he definitely didn't die at the end of that scene. So, like, next time we see him, I'm sure he's going to be slowly, like, rising back up into, holy fuck, this guy's doing some evil shit to other people to get to our people. And then there's going to be this epic confrontation. And, yeah, hopefully it's Moraine. Because, or now, honestly, hopefully it's Perrin or Egwene over Moraine. I feel like they have a better reason to kill him now. Yeah, Perrin I just think is this just guy a is a great actor, man. Yeah. He just pops off the screen. He might be my favorite actor in the show almost at this point. Nynaeve's up there, but he's just so good at being this little weasel. I mean, and even like changing the way that he speaks, he's like his voice is very kind of high and it kind of bounces a little bit. And then like when he's correcting Egwene to call him child, Valda, like his voice gets a little more serious. And I just, I really like this guy, mm-hmm. but obviously I enjoyed what happened to him. I think that he is either done for this season or will only pop up again in the finale because I think it's time to let that what his acts that he did to Perrin and Egwene just kind of brew in in the fandom and let people build hate in their own 
minds and then bring him back strong in season two or in the end of season one. I don't think we're getting him in six or seven. Yeah, it does seem like we have bigger fish to fry at this point. As long as there's not like another mini time skip like that, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't expect him to to see him either. Yeah, he had his and Perrin. Perrin is just a man. I mean, he's, was he... he's, there was wolves in the background the entire time. Every time he was on screen, there was wolves in the background. Um, and then at the end, he's like, yeah, like these wolves won't hurt us. Like they're on our side. Like he's got the eyes glowing. I wanted yeah, that... him to like turn into a wolf and just tear fucking Valda apart. I genuinely, with my werewolf uh, theory, like a couple episodes ago, I was really waiting for that transformation moment for him to just bust out of there and just rip Valda's fucking head off. But we didn't get that. So I don't think it's I'm throwing the werewolf theory out the window right now. Like he has the power to control wolves is all I'm saying right now. (laughs) He just does. He's not going to turn into one, but I just think he has the power to control them as of right now. It might be a little premature for me and Kyle to fully start talking about Perrin, but this is totally what I've been waiting the most for these first like five, four episodes to get more information on parents. So we can have more conversations about what the fuck's going on with him. Not just knowing what's going on with him, but like have more detailed conversations than just he keeps scratching his legs and he has the wolf dreams. It's going to be really fun. If they, I hope they give us a little bit more to, to latch onto and, and theorize over in this next couple episodes. But so far, I mean, I love hearing Dave talk about werewolves and all this shit. So fun. Uh, bold prediction he was the wolf king in his last turn of the wheel mm. and now all wolves just like respect him now because of his last <laughs> life all right i'm just gonna say i love the fact that you're incorporating now past lives into the theories i feel like you guys are the two of you are really getting into the swing of kind of the themes of wheel of time and what actually happens in the world so keep them coming yeah i mean yeah. we saw we saw parent fix that wheel what was that episode four <laughs> I love that you love that scene. Symbolism. So <laughs> We're on to that. But I, I do also want to talk about because Paul especially had been harping on this for it's been, I guess, four or five episodes at this point. Perrin finally admits that he killed his wife. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was very happy that he was able to at least get his slate clean a little bit, get it off his chest. It sucks that it literally drove him until literally getting tortured getting carved into but uh i did like that he shared it and Egwene had a really good response to it i think she handled it i think we save a lot of that conversation because that's going to be i have some things to say about that too but definitely good i'm surprised with his time with the tinker just my first reaction i was thinking you know that he would have because honestly when we see that time skip and then we do get that shot of Perrin after the time skip like the sun's beating on him a little bit like he seems like a little bit more like up upbeat a little bit like as if he was really getting into the tinker culture and i was really expecting him to have already told someone especially a month later but no trifles again like there's just a small thing that i was thinking about but um, can you imagine if they off screened that that would have sucked yeah but I, i really thought he was getting like like it really felt like with the sun hitting him in the face and how he had like a oh it was like a really light smile of while they were all walking i just really see him getting into the tinkerer lifestyle i I feel like at least or adopting those beliefs so that's kind of all i had written down just some major bullet points to hit just curious if there's anything any last thoughts people want to bring up before we kind of just dive quickly into our first hit episode ratings and then we can get the hell out of here um, I just think overall that coming off of such a great episode like episode four, it's obviously going to be really hard to follow that up. And especially since we're only halfway through the season, you know, you don't want to get thrown everything in just like a couple episodes midway. You know, we're supposed to get these kind of if you even want to call it a lull episode. But this is one episode that I made this comment after watching it that this is going to be an episode that I will personally have to watch at least two more times. Like I'm talking like. I want three episode watches when I get into this because there is just so much storytelling and um, just talk of characters and what they're doing like off screen and just the history of the wheel that I just I'm sitting there for the first time watching and I'm just all of it's going over my head like I don't understand the references yet Um, but I I want to get them to a better I want to get to that understanding so I definitely think that if there is going to be one episode that you want to rewatch for informational purposes that this is going to be the one. Yeah, I mean, I might have loved it more than last episode. Last episode was wow. great TV, and I 
I might be recency biased just because the more you get to the story, the better it is. But I absolutely loved it. Cannot wait for the next one. I think shit is just going to just keep hitting the fan and getting more and more intense. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think Dave summed it up perfectly. It's going to be so tough for the internet to not to accept the come down of the the four high. And I'm actually shocked that Paul likes this one better. I definitely I can appreciate it, especially as a book reader. And I think it's going to go a long way in the terms of I to die world building. But uh, yeah, I think it was probably on par with like episode three. So I would give it a solid like seven out of 10 compared to the last one. I gave it a 10 out of 10. So big difference, but still high quality television. Before we get in the ratings, one last comment I want to make is uh, all the viewers listening and everything. A lot of people have been telling us that um, episode six is going to be really insane and that what episode seven is the one that the um, director no, or no, Moraine loves episode seven. Moraine's character loves episode seven. And we've also heard that six is insane. And then the showrunner loves episode eight. And of course, eight is going to be great because it's the finale. But just letting the audience know that we have three episodes of television that are just going to blow us away. And if you thought four was good, just hang tight because six, seven, eight sound like they're going to be a treat. Yeah. Yeah, this is just a great breather episode. Mm -hmm. We yeah. couldn't possibly keep going higher after four. So <laughs> there is no way. It's, it's nice to take a breather and maybe learn some more things about the world that we're in. So, Luke, you popped off with what was that, a seven out of 10, you said? Yep. Ah, it's hard. I, I'm going to say it's a 7.5. I think that this isn't going to be again. I, almost every episode in this early, in the early seasons are going to get better as we get farther into the story and look back at them. So this one will change in the future, but I think it's a solid seven and a half. My score, like even when I watched it the one time, I just knew it was like just a solid seven, like nothing bad, nothing amazing, but just a solid piece of television. Yeah, I honestly, I'm going to give it an eight. I just loved the, the more storyline developing, like a little reunion, not all of them together. Um, characters like kind of figuring out who they are a little bit more, you know, introduction of loyal. I mean, he's, he's the man. So I, I eight for me. All Dang. right. So pretty, uh, pretty tight distribution of scores there. Just a solid episode overall. That'll be it for our instant reaction. We appreciate you sticking with us this entire way. Um, we obviously we are Binge Town TV. You can find us at uh, at Binge Town TV <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, this is the first time I can say this. I guess uh, like and subscribe. That would actually help us out a lot. We're kind of obviously new to this YouTube ship, but it's been fun uh, kind of interacting with everyone in the comments. So please comment anything you like. We try to answer all of them. Um, we actually, I mean, we cover a lot of TV shows. This is going to be episode like one of the podcasts, 178, something like that. So we can check out our, you guys rather can check out our website, bingetowntv.com. We have everything organized by show.